Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining today's session. So this panel uh, will focus on engineering uh, Africa's energy transition. We'll discuss now innovation, challenges, and sustainable solutions. Uh, it will be uh, a panel discussion. Um, and to kick us off uh, today, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Sion Su, Deputy to the Director General and Managing Director of the Directorate of Technical Cooperation and Sustainable Industrial Development at UNIDO to provide some opening remarks. Thank you, thank you. Uh, distinguished uh, guests and uh, partners, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm pleased to welcome you uh, on behalf of UNIDO to this set event organized by the Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition, a global high-level body of engineers and energy system experts providing scientific and engineering perspectives to the UN Secretary General on key technologies for energy transition. UNIDO, as the UN Special Agency, mandated to promote inclusive and sustainable industrial development, is proud to co-host the Council of Energies for uh, Engineers for Energy Transition. We provide state-of-art scientific and engineering perspectives to support the UN family. So today's session, Engineering Africa's Energy Transition, Innovations, Challenges, and Sustainable Solutions, discusses how to the continent of Africa, with its vast potential and a varied uh, topography, is on the verge of an energy revolution. So unquestionably, there is a present need to resolve the divergent priorities for decarbonizing power systems in Africa and address the prevailing energy access gaps. One sixth of the world population rises in Africa. Uh, you may have already heard from the opening that of DG Muller and also um, uh, SDG's special advisor on uh, Africa, Mr. Drought, the situation now faced in Africa. So uh, basically Africa people uh, represent less than 6% of total water energy consumption and less than 3% of total global emissions. So Africa is a growing continent with a very young population and apple development potential. This presents an opportunity to drive investment in a sustainable energy infrastructure and leapfrogging into no carbon options. Many African countries are not yet on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal 7 target of ensuring everyone can access affordable, dependable, sustainable, and modern energy. Nearly 600 million Africans equivalent to 43% of the continent's population, lacked access to electricity in 2021, and 80% of the population still relies on traditional biomass for preparing food. This, in turn, results in more than 500,000 annual deaths linked to indoor pollution. So engineering pathways and technologies that can reshape Africa's energy landscape should stand at the heart of Africa's transformation. We firmly believe that by focusing on engineering and the technology aspects, we can create a solid foundation for achieving clean energy goals in the continent. Distinct guests, UNIDO is committed to further assist member states globally and work alongside partners to advance the energy transition and promote synergies with industrial transformation. The energy transition is crucial to achieving our mandate of promoting inclusive and sustainable industrial development, and the industrialization is key to unlock the full benefit of the energy transition. So through the combination of policy advisory services and technical cooperation, UNIDO is well positioned to serve the continent. I would like to end by thanking all the engineers on the council for their commitment and contribution to the Council's work. I would also like 
to thank the Sustainable Development Solution Network, SDSN in short, and Professor Sachs personally for the excellent collaboration to drive the concert's work. Thanks also to the Enia Foundation for its support to the Council and the final appreciation for all sister agencies within the UN family that continuously feed into this work. I hope this conversation will spark new ideas and solutions to advance Africa's transformation. And let's work together to engineer Africa's energy transition so that we all benefit from a better, most sustainable future. Thank you. for the remarks. Um, now we'll move straight to the discussion. I'd like to invite uh, to the stage uh, Nora Maguero, founder and CEO of Drop Access, and uh, one of the members of the UN Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition. Uh, I'll also like to invite uh, Mrs. Emida Silvera, uh, professor at Cornell University and member of the UN Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition. Mr. Peter Gorge, a partner and co-investment director are at Spark Plus Africa Fund. Um, to also invite Ana Maria Camelo Vega, senior economics and finance researcher at Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. And to our moderator today, uh, Mrs. Raya Salawi, chief of the energy section, sustainable development policy divisions at UN Esqua. Uh, over to you, Raya. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for the welcome and remark for setting the stage. And let's consider we are the in the African continent. Our objective is how really to implement uh, large-scale solutions because the gap is certainly large and it's needed, all the effort are needed. Uh, since we speak about the Council of Engineers, so certainly we look at innovative solutions from the energy uh, engineering perspective, be it innovative solutions uh, from the business model, uh, financial capacity building, but also customized solutions to the local context of Africa. Uh, the uh, maybe uh, to start with uh, the uh, the end uh, for the supply chain, maybe for the role of private sector. What we've seen in in Africa, there's uh, excellent business models and case studies of implementation uh, from also the role of private sector in implementing decentralized solutions, be it uh, on electricity uh, electricity access, but also on clean cooking. And uh, Nora, you have, uh, uh, you have an excellent, I would say, uh, uh, experience in this field. Specifically, I've been listening to you in the previous session, and uh, I enjoyed listening, uh, although it's, uh, the, the entry point was from agenda. But I would like to hear from you from private sector perspective, how you see that uh, the role of engineers were looking to innovative solutions to help to adjust the access gap, but specifically uh, customer to the local context of Africa, and how you see the role of private sector. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, yes, my name is Nora Magero. I am from Kenya. I'm an engineer by profession and also um, council, a member of the Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition. I, I am the co-chair for the Energy Access Working Group, so the responsibility is huge. Um, especially for Africa, I always feel like, oh my God, this better work, you know. We have to drive this agenda. And um, from an engineering perspective, and also just working a bit within the, the energy or other clean energy sector, I can uh, I say that for us to really just drive the agenda home and to achieve uh, this the goals of the strategies that we've set, I believe uh, we must generate as much as possible from clean energy solutions uh, and just ensure that they just, for starters, access for anybody who needs it. And second, we must have productive use for this power because um, there's so many issues um, affecting the continent, the African continent. We have poverty, we have uh, uh, poverty and its children now, energy access and all intertwining that. And it all the statistics keep on bothering me. Like ever since I was growing up, I used to hear these statistics. It's, it's just staggering. Uh, it's not really changing as fast as possible. And having worked as an engineer in this space and uh, uh, running my own organization that produces technologies within the African continent. I feel like if we just have enough productive use and uh, 
uh, practical technologies to, to off take all this generation that you want within the continent, then we can actually make a very big dent in, into that transition that we foresee. And obviously engineers, as engineers, we, we play a very big role in ensuring that there is appropriate R&D done and it's also equitable R&D. And when I talk of equitable R&D and uh, technology development uh, from an engendered perspective, um, Sadly enough, with the energy poverty, we women are the most uh, afflicted by it because also we're the biggest interactors. And we find that the technologies that are being brought into the market, we're always trying to fit into them. Uh, and I feel like we're not really achieving our muscles of uh, equitable energy access that targets women. So I feel they, there's still an opportunity to just develop technologies that truly embraces the woman persona truly embraces the typical rural home, typical rural, typical off-grid uh, situation, uh, uh, that kind of persona. And, uh, and uh, it's long-lasting, like it contributes and has compounding impacts to it. Let's give more than light, even as we do more generation and bring into technologies. But we have to come up with, the, uh, with the engineered solutions that are, are economically viable. And that's why I always still go back to productive use. If we're going to generate as much as possible, we engineers, it's our responsibility to ensure that we are bringing so many technologies to maturity. Uh, we bring them as fast as possible. We bring them to be better and quality technologies that still fit into the African ecosystem and just drive the gender home. That truly it gets to a point where we start, we just completely change the statistics of 600K people who don't have access to electricity or even is it 800K now because of COVID. So for, for us as an engineer, I feel personally responsible to take part in just development of these technologies outrightly. Whether it's a technology that is going to uh, impact uh, the food ecosystem for food security, Food security is still a very big issue in my continent, which doesn't make sense considering like with such a pro productive uh, landscape of we have enough land, but obviously there's so many issues that are affecting food security and also climate change is coming in to just rip so many of the gains that we keep on making. But then also healthcare is still a big issue, so we must put in the technologies as engineers that still plays in the nexus of energy access and healthcare, energy access and, uh, and education. And it's our role as engineers to ensure that these technologies truly meet the goals. Um, I know capitalism has so much to play in what's coming to the market and we can't help it. At the end of the day, an investor will want to know, and I'm maybe <laughs> just, you want to know like how, where's the money gonna flow? Like uh, how is it moving from point A to point B? Because whoever's bringing the money wants to find out uh, how am I gonna make my money out of it? And it's business and it makes sense and business drive the world. But then the impact side of these technologies truly being sustainable and impacting so much, that lies with us as engineers. As we bring them to fruition, as we bring them to maturity, is a responsibility to truly ascertain and evaluate that they're equitable as much as possible. And it still goes back to R&Ds, still goes back to research uh, through engineering and also engineering for the future. So I used to joke a lot when I, I, I was um, trying to develop solutions within the water energy food nexus that Africa being the young continent also taking up clean energy technologies. 25 years are gonna come when the, all the solars that have been installed in the capacity are going to be degraded. What are we gonna do? Are we gonna go back to square one and say, ooh, now we have a landfill of solar panels? I find that truly unacceptable. So that is why we come in and just integrate engineering solutions that truly really last. I want to see circularity models that off take the solar panels, the wind turbines, the, the blades, and recycle <coughs> them back into the economy and meaningfully create economic value for the continent, maybe introduce manufacturing uh, within the African ecosystem and truly introduce manufacturing and finance it. Because I am, a, I am a manufacturer and there's so many issues with manufacturing within the, the, the continent, especially clean tech manufacturing, because it's been done somewhere else. China is a big player in manufacturing and normally people say that, ooh, Nora, why are you making solar fridges in Kenya? And you can actually take it to China, but then, come on, the jobs that to be created, uh, the, the circularity models that we're including in our manufacturing that is not being done somewhere else. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, uh, you bring me to the, when we speak about the productive use, and this is where really you can implement a integrated solution that help to address several SDGs, but also address the climate actions. I've been implementing the West in Asia, specifically in the countries like uh, Lebanon, where we have conflict. We've seen how when we integrate solutions uh, that address the water engine nexus, and from engineer perspective, when you look at also the circularity, you not only you empower the woman, you empower the community, you generate revenues, but also from social inclusion in conflict areas is extremely important. And that's why maybe uh, to look at, uh, uh, in this aspect, did, uh, good that you did mention the circularity and productive use, it's good also to see how uh, 
just when we speak about biogas, for example. Uh, maybe we speak about biogas when we, we link that uh, to not only the access to electricity, but also monitoring that also to clean cooking. And how, from your perspective, Samida, since you've been working on that, and it's something that is uh, close to your heart, and you say al always this is the, the, the low hanging fruit. From your perspective, how really expanding on that? And an example that you, you, you knew from the region uh, and the African continent can really help to, from innovative solution and engineering, help to address the, the access gap. Thank you. Is this Thank you very much. Thank you for this question. Um, I'm Samila Silveira, and I'm today professor at Cornell University. Uh, but um, uh, um, I would say that what characterizes my background is energy and climate policy, uh, sustainability, and I have always passionated. I was always passionate about uh, uh, the topic of development and the challenge of development. And then when it comes to energy, as an energy planner, um, my take is that energy is cross-cutting. So whenever I say I'm an energy planner, people say, which technology? So we are <laughs> in the, in the uh, um, Council of Engineers, but I say, no, it's not the technology. It, the technology is one important part of it, uh, but technology is actually 30% of the business. Uh, the other 70% is all the service or everything that actually generates all the spillovers. And I think one we didn't some a big uh, mistake we made uh, in if we see in perspective is to think that energy, w knowing that energy is so important for development, taking it as a linear process. First we bring the energy and then we bring the development. But that's not the way it goes. Um, it goes, everything has to happen at the same time. And uh, so we in, the, in the council, we have uh, uh, developed a brief on the biogas, um, which uh, is kind of in, in incorporates this, this, this idea. Uh, and uh, we I just came from the, the panel on cook clean cooking, and uh, it was a fantastic uh, uh, panel, a very many panels, three panels. Uh, but nobody said the word biogas. And biogas, uh, the brief we developed, biogas, uh, small-scale biogas uh, for cooking in rural areas. And it was very important that it was this focus because biogas in large scale is picking up now for biomethane production, uh, for wastewater management uh, in urban areas, uh, for landfill management, et cetera. But small-scale biomass, will fit into the structure of farming in, in sub-Saharan Africa, where you have many, many small farms. And uh, yes, we can organize it also at the community level, but not always. And it is a low-hanging fruit. Wherever you have some crop, wherever you have two cows, wherever you have a few pigs, you have what you need to produce a small-scale biogas for cooking. And that cooking will bring, it, it's cooking and it's lighting, even before you do anything else. Um, you know, when we did the cook stoves, we were focused on the efficiency of the cook stove. That's why I say we cannot only think of the technology because we worked so hard for to improve the combustion of the cook stove. And you improve the combustion of the cooking stove. And was very surprised that people were not using it. And I challenge if it's only culture. It's not only culture, but by improving the combustion, you closed the, the, the light and it took away the heat that is also important in many places. So you took, you took away two services. You kept the cooking because you focused only on the cooking. Yeah? But now we have to do the cooking and we need to think affordability. So we are asking people to go away from a, from a, from a fuel that, that they collect for free uh, the dung or the or the the the, the um, wood fuel, and go over to pay for the cooking fuel, um, and uh, it can happen in Brazil. The the, the LPG really gained uh, uh, traction and and it went very fast in in rural areas and everywhere. But we also see that today in hard times. Uh, when people uh, don't have money, they go over to wood fuel some places again because affordability remains an issue and LPG is expensive. 
so what we did in this brief on the biogas is to look at w in what ways it could be a solution, and we have looked at experiences from all over the world in different uh, I for a small scale biogas, and how it actually how much we have learned that it can even work in arid areas because you need also water for the biogas but it can work also in arid areas, but you have to contextualize the technology. It can, you need the support for that technology to work because it will not go by on, on its own, but where it, it succeeded, it created even income because as a, result, a residue of that, you have the fertilizer that people have used for agriculture. So as we push for the development of agriculture, which has to happen for food security, uh, if we do this together, with the energy, with the cooking fuel uh, solutions. Uh, we have the feedstocks there, and that will increase the resilience and, the, and empower the local communities with a feedstock that they already have. And uh, th with two cows, you can you cook as much as you want, two meals uh, per day. Uh, and uh, and I, I have visited projects of this type, and you have the light, uh, because you can use uh, the, the, the gas for, for lighting, and that can be a step stone for other uses of the biogas. In Bangladesh, in fact, we, we, we put an, a membrane because Bangladesh has real problems with uh, arsenic in the water. So if you want to drink clean water in Bangladesh, you have to uh, buy clean water. Uh, but when, when doing the biogas, in the process you have the low heat of the biogas generation, and that low heat is enough to actually clean the water with a membrane. It is fantastic. So we got two products, increase the total efficiency. So for me, it's the total efficiency of the system and actually building also bottom-up the solutions that are uh, on the ground. Yeah, thank you very much. And actually, uh, building on efficiency helps to build the resilience as well. And uh, look into that integrated solution when it comes to clean cooking, a lot of LPG, but all of that, uh, when we speak about biogas, is all of that uh, need not only uh, policy uh, support and regulations, but need the finance in order to upscale. And this is uh, the, the, the major challenge that we, we, we face specifically on de risk in this kind of project. And that's why I want to, to hear more uh, from Peter uh, when you speak about uh, uh, de risk and investment, uh, specifically uh, in a continent where uh, we d we're, we're speaking about the, the, the access gap on electricity, but also clean cooking, and specific clean cooking, which is not taken maybe seriously, or let's say not on the top of the agenda of policy makers when it comes versus uh, access to electricity. When there is a potential to integrate both, as highlighted by Semida, looking both solutions can help uh, to address both gap. So from your perspective, how you see really how we can make uh, impact on that scale from an e in a finance and engineering perspective, and what's the business model you see maybe from clean cooking uh, and your experience in this field. Great. No, thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I'm uh, not at all an engineer, so, so completely outmatched in technical regard. Uh, but I, I'm Peter George. I co-manage a fund called Spark Plus, uh, which is a fund that we developed during my time working with the Clean Cooking Alliance. Um, the fund is uh, a $64 million debt fund. Uh, with capital from a mix of public and private investors. So we have uh, DFIs, um, the US uh, DFI DFC, we have the European Commission, African Development Bank, uh, IFU from Denmark, and BIO from Belgium. I think I covered all of them. Uh, and then we have a mix of private investors, including uh, family offices, foundations, and Swiss pension funds. We have a number of pension <laughs> funds from Switzerland. So. To your question, um, I mean, in the clean cooking space, there, there are a number of really interesting innovations occurring. One is a fund like ours. It's a blended fund that's using concessional money from governments and foundations to essentially mobilize co uh, commercial capital from pension funds and other sort of commercial investors. And the way that it's, it's sort of set up, it's a structured, uh, it's almost like a, a mortgage-backed security where you have different tranches within the fund that take different levels of risk and earn different returns. Um, and so that allows different types of money to come into a very nascent sector like clean cooking. Um, so that's an interesting innovation. It's a way to leverage public, commercial, uh, public concessional capital to mobilize private co commercial capital. Um, 
on the technology side, I mean, the reason why we were able to make the case to both the public and private investors who invested in the fund that now is the time to fund a, uh, an investment fund to invest in the sector. Obviously, if we had been doing this five or 10 years ago, they would have said, sounds nice, nice initiative, but what are you investing in? And how are you going to have successful investments? Because ultimately, even if we're the concessional money, we want our money back. If we're the commercial money, we want our money back with a higher return. Um, so what's happening now in the sector is that there are a number of different business models that are really innovative and really you know, integrate different forms of technology, internet of things, um, everything from uh, you know, um, smart meter enabled LPG business models where you add a, a smart meter with a, a SIM card, you know, a GSM chip, uh, that locks and unlocks depending on whether you've paid for the fuel for the day so that you can essentially purchase LPG in the same way that you would purchase a tin of uh, charcoal um, to uh, you know another model that's really interesting that's starting to scale outside of Kenya it's already at a million customers in Kenya um, is LP, uh, sorry ethanol through um, an, a network of fuel ATMs so the fuel ATMs are uh, mobile money enabled. You can use your M-Pesa uh, account to purchase, again, a very small amount of ethanol in the way that you would purchase charcoal or wood. Um, that you know, is another example of integrating technology. We're looking at companies that are integrating pay-as-you-go um, uh, technology into electric cook stoves, induction cookers. So then you might make induction cooking electric uh, for the consumers who are on the grid or have, uh, you know, have electricity um, affordable because the, the big gap is it's both the operating cost, it's the running cost, but it's really the upfront purchase price. And so if you can spread that purchase price over, over time, as you do with a pay-as-you-go enabled electric appliance, then it's much more accessible and affordable for more people. So there's all kinds of technology being integrated into uh, different business models across pellets, you know, ethanol, LPG, uh, even biomass cook stoves. We're looking at a company that is integrating, again, uh, a USSD technology into the stove that then sinks at various periods, not every day, but it'll sink every, you know, let's say every month or couple months and transfers the usage data. Uh, which then generate very high quality carbon credits because they're backed by the actual usage data. And that's a stove that can burn wood, charcoal, uh, dung, other sort of traditional biomass much cleaner. Then the last, the last thing I'll just mention is that, you know, the other innovation that's really critical to this market is carbon finance. Um, you know, it, it is just impossible to serve much of the unserved, you know, market with regards to clean cooking, the, you know, let's say the between 60 to 90 percent of most countries in Africa that are cooking with traditional fuels, you will be unable to serve the, most of that market on a purely commercial basis. You need subsidy. You need carbon finance. You need somebody to add revenues to the companies to enable them to be sustainable. If you rely on the customers to, to, to support the, the, the the business model in full, it just won't work. It doesn't work for most customers. There are companies that are serving urban consumers, middle, more middle income, let's say lower middle income consumers that can operate more commercially, um, but we will never get to clean cooking for all without significant uh, subsidy of some kind, however you wanna call it. And on the carbon side, I mean, there's all kinds of challenges and discussions around integrity of carbon credits. There's the, you know, sort of coming Article 6.2, 6.4 markets, but there's a lot of innovation occurring around how do we generate higher quality credits, how do we uh, pre-finance, because ultimately, if you have the buyers for the credits, that's a big step, right? That, that's really important, but you also need to convince investors, banks, funds <coughs> like ours, equity investors, that it's worth taking the risk to develop the project that will ultimately yield the credits. And um, there's all kinds of, let's say financial, to your, to your point, Radia, financial engineering and structuring uh, that needs to be done that's also very high transaction cost 
in order to get these projects uh, you know, to financial close. And we're working on that, and I think that's, that was one of the reasons to set up a fund that's really focused on this space, because if we weren't focused on this space, we would go do something easier. It's really challenging to, to invest in clean cooking, but I mean, we, we see a lot of opportunity, and obviously from a, an impact standpoint, it's a hugely impactful uh, sector. Maybe I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, um, I'm working on a report on the clean cooking for the LDCs and looking to the, the uh, I mean, innovative solution when it comes to financing. And uh, uh, I mean, what you did mention uh, showed that I was impressed by the different example in the uh, African continent when it comes to uh, uh, looking to, uh, for example, applying a blockchain solutions uh, at a small scale. And really, uh, you see how really communities, when you think that they don't have the skills and the capacity to really just uh, use this kind of uh, solutions, but you can actually implement them. And then it comes to how to upscale all of that and how to bring all the community, as the example you did mention, really how to make it at scale, uh, because it's really about innovative solutions, what I call financial solutions, but it's finance engineering solutions. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's all the, 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 the puzzle of that we need to, to create in order to, to, to have to upscale the investment. And that's why, uh, since we, we are within the framework of the uh, Council of Engineering, uh, and uh, although I'm an engineer by background, but, uh, uh, but also you are engineering in financial aspect as well, so, uh, and always when you speak about the energy transition and the summation of the energy system, specifically in the African continent, we speak about the lack of infrastructure, obviously the investment, but also the skills that we need. The skills that we need at all sectors, but let's focus on the engineering part. Uh, so maybe uh, uh, this question actually, you we, we take it from uh, from different. Um, I want to, to hear from all of you, but maybe I start with you, know, Ali, with the way you see it. Uh, how from uh, we we need to what are the skills that we need to work on them from the engineering perspective, in order to build the capacity that they help us to implement such innovative integrated solutions that are cross cutting. It's not just about the energy sector. To be honest, I I don't know how to wrap that up into just picking a specific skill and say that this is this is it. This is what we really need to introduce. But I I've, I've seen what um, uh, capacity development, specifically when it comes to technical knowledge uh, on uh, clean energy technologies, or just energy technologies, uh, whether it's uh, a training on um, on installation, on uh, grid maintenance, grid development, uh, grid uh, innovation has really played a very big role, specifically for Kenya, to the point where Kenya has got to the point where it's close to almost n uh, over 75% uh, national coverage for electricity. Uh, obviously, it's still lagging behind when it comes to just ensuring that everybody truly has access and has access throughout the year, because that, that now brings into question the the stability of our grids as a country and also just the technologies that can just push it to the last uh, la last mile. So I, I see a future where we really need to teach um, on innovation. Just literally start a way of how we can rigorously innovate various kinds of uh, technologies that can be incorporated within the energy sector. I don't know how to you can spark or teach innovation, but then maybe um, putting people in real life examples of how to just create or rather rethink uh, innovation or rethink um, models how to do models of delivery um, I yeah I, do, I, I don't know if we'll yeah <laughs> I, I mean I, I really like it when you say that how uh, catching on innovation and obviously uh, it comes all about the change in the curriculum vita bit uh, at different level of um, I mean of a university that's why I wanted to hear from Samida uh, since uh, this is uh, obviously uh, uh, your area of intervention I would say uh, and you've been familiar maybe of course yes to see how uh, the uh, the student community have changed the way they think, uh, the needs of the markets, and the gap that exists between what the universities provide, research institutions within the universities and research center compared to the what the private sector and the markets need. So, how, from your perspective, and we remain in the African continent, we can really uh, look at what what the innovative solutions are that we need to uh, uh, build the capacity of the students at the universities. Yeah, well, that's a fantastic question. And I think the universities are going through in changes that they have not experienced in hundreds of years. 
And that's because of many reasons. Uh, partly because you, can, you have other players when it comes to education, you have other players in the market. Uh, but also because what, what, what you said, that sometimes you, y there is not a good match maybe with how the, the, the education is formed and, and, and what the needs are. You know, I'm in systems engineering w in, in Cornell. We are one of the five programs in the United States. And what do we do? What do we teach in systems engineering? We have engineers from many different backgrounds. And uh, the point is to understand first that the challenges that we have today, they are not you know, narrow challenges, that they are complex challenges. Like we have seen climate is a very complex challenge. Energy, which is deeply correlated, and then we, a climate problem is you know, the rent we, sp we playing we pay the rent for, for not including uh, low carbon uh, in, the, in the specification of the energy solutions that we have worked with because we were not as aware as we are today. Um, but we teach to, you know, to bring together stakeholders. How do you actually implement a project that has so many facets? And, uh, and I think on the side of the, the project developers and the funders to understand that you cannot design a project too strict, too, too, too narrow. You have to allow, you know, I have a project with, with funded by the Innovation Agency in Sweden, and, and it was the best funder I've ever, ever had because they were pragmatic and realized that we had a project, we had a structure, we were making a lot of progress according to the structure we created, but they did not give us a hard time with long reports and, and things. They wanted to, to see that things were happening on the ground, that it was really having impact, and it did. Uh, so we got, so, and then when it, we, I would like to bring this now to the, to the example of biogas again, uh, because it's such a big uh, question, and, and, and then to the context of Africa, where I think many universities still has, have the model that they have inherited from colonial times, and uh, we need the university to be much more on the ground, on engaged directly in developing the topic, in addressing, for example, from biogas, the contextualization is so important, and then you work with the university to, for that contextualization, for the monitoring, for the evaluation of impacts at different, uh, in different aspects, and then you, the university has a different role, and we have seen this in a, in a, in a partnership I have in Brazil in a city, uh, how we as academics also answered for the continuity of the projects beyond one project we, because we have the education as, as, as our role and then we can pass that knowledge to different people. But really working together, the university, the, 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 the policymakers at the local level and in the case of the biogas, we need to work with the farmers. And uh, I think the, the, um, uh, the farmers can, can learn you know, I remember when we started payment system in Sweden in cell phone, and 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 we laughed when 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 the the, the Swedish um, researchers found out the Maasai were already using it because there was no bank, so they were already using it before. So I think that that people are smart; they will will learn when they see that the impact on their lives is there. And as we see agri food industry, uh, agri food uh, uh, activities. Uh, the emissions from agri-food is increasing very fast now, and I think the plug-in uh, of the, the, the biogas and solutions in the rural areas as we develop the agri-food industry uh, is a very interesting plug-in. Uh, so not looking at clean cooking and, and energy as something that comes separately and apart or for uh, before, but comes together and that is also uh, income generating and, and opening other opportunities. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, as you did mention, and I think uh, you need to use an example of uh, UN institution also that look at integrated solutions, specifically with the agri-food industry, and uh, speaking about the capacity building and how really to bridge the gap between what we have uh, at the universities and the project that we undertake, which what the private sector and the markets need, but also 
is somehow the sustainability of this kind of project, but the donors have a key role in order to maintain all of that. And not all donors how I would say, strategic, I would say, thinking in terms of integrated solutions. And maybe uh, since we spoke with the Water Energy Food Nexus, and they think part of the, the, the discussion that we had is how really to encourage that the curriculum uh, in the universities that uh, electric engineer, industrial engineer, and I recall when I was in university as an industrial and petroleum engineering, I didn't know about the water energy food nexus, for example. And when implementing field project of that within the UN system, I learned more about the food safety, agriculture practices, and the water energy food next implement the field, and the, all of that, it's a continuous process. But speak about capacity building and also continuing the engineering perspective and innovation in order to address the access gap. Also from a finance aspect, this is also I want to hear from Peter, because one of the things that we, we've seen in terms of addressing the access gap is really how to build the capacity of financial institutions to understand the issues of clean cooking, for example, I mean, as an example, in order to basically the policy makers, the private sector, to speak the same language. So from your perspective, what's the, what's, what's you think that uh, it's needed to be done in this aspect? Um, that's a good question. I mean, there, there is, uh, there's definitely capacity gaps amongst financial institutions. Uh, in, in various um, aspects. I think that it's a really tough question. <laughs> um, I think, um, you know, it depends at what level. So obviously we're, we're working with um, uh, different levels of, of financial institutions from MFIs that are financing consumers to commercial banks that are financing the same sorts of companies that we would lend to, that we would invest in. Um, and there are different challenges as to why MFIs aren't, you know, necessarily financing or creating the right loan products to finance clean cooking solutions, for example, or energy access solutions more broadly, biogas, solar home systems, cook stoves, whatever the case may be. <coughs> um, and, and some of that relates to lack of knowledge. Some of that relates to just sheer economics. You know, it may, f it may make more sense for their business model to um, finance, you know, to provide other sorts of loans. Um, there are lots of reasons why financial institutions aren't lending to companies in the space, in the energy space sort of broadly. Um, and some of it has to do with the immature, uh, immaturity of the business models, the relative, you know, relatively innovative nature of the business models. Banks aren't venture capitalists. They don't love innovation. They love proven cash flow stable kind of companies. Um, they'd rather finance a company that builds roads than, than is doing all kinds of technology enabled clean cooking, right? Um, so there, but there are, there are gaps in terms of capacity, in terms of knowledge, in terms of uh, building the right partnerships. Um, but some of it just comes down to the pure sort of the risk and the, the return aspects, right? Again, I, I mentioned before that, that many of these business models just aren't very profitable, right? And nor would you want them to be, right? You wouldn't want to have wildly profitable business models selling, you know, cook stoves to the poorest people in the, w in the world, right? Th this shouldn't be a super profitable, uh, exciting business model in a sense. But when you don't have um, the, the track record that banks want to see and the ability for the, these companies to provide, uh, you know, debt to these companies at an attractive rate for them, and, and they find other more attractive um, uh, lending opportunities, that's why then the capital doesn't flow. So um, I think, uh, yeah, I think maybe I'll leave it there. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, please, yes. Yeah. I wanted to comment on this because I think that uh, uh, project finance, once, as you said, once you've proven uh, a concept for project finance, then it trickles down. We have seen this for wind power. Uh, until the, 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 the financial sector did not understand the, the, the project finance. And then it peaked very quickly because project finance for, for wind power is relatively simple. Uh, but when you come to biomass based, it gets very complicated. And I think this is one of the re reasons why 
for biomass, the project finance, you have more stakeholders, you have more risk in, in different ends. And yeah, oh, well it's on the feedstock side, it's the technology side, it's the users. So it's, it's too kind of fluid. And then the financial sector doesn't like. So I think one of the gaps could be also to look at ways in which the financial sector can create um, models that can trickle down in, a, in an effective way uh, to the local level. In in collaborating for you know so that you you have this scale because usually the financial models like the the, 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 the uh, some sort of scale and then you have the scale and then the how you break this down in a meaningful way and I think it was mentioned today earlier in 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 the panels we were in on the on how carbon markets could perhaps be one trigger for for kind of pushing for solutions in in the, in that direction. Yeah, and uh, still that we need engineers also on the financial institutions. Uh, and uh, I can see that uh, we did uh, a vision of um, climate finance and I was impressed by uh, one of the uh, the banks, how they have the sustainability programs and they do have engineers. That's this is the sustainability program that come up in the, the bank and it helps them basically to, to see things differently, understand the technical aspect, understand the how you implement projects and the specificity of the uh, rural context and the integrated solutions. Maybe uh, before giving the floor to Anna, I would like to see if we can take, uh, we have any questions from the floor. Since engineering, it's about energy and uh, energy, I mean, you know, it's uh, about all the, the positive energy that we can get to power the African continent. Uh, can I have a question from the floor? Because I still have one question uh, before giving the floor to Anna. Yes, please. Thanks to all the speakers, a uh, very uh, great discussion. I mean, a few things that came into my mind, I mean, I think one was primarily as, <coughs> uh, if there might be comments, I mean, about the very high cost of finance for developing countries, which I think is a very well-known and acknowledged barrier. And the other one um, in relation more particularly to the clean cooking fuels is uh, fossil fuel subsidies, which remain absolutely huge and could be extremely possibly painful thing to get rid of in developing countries for the poorest people, but uh, absolutely essential in terms of the energy and climate transition. Your name, please. Uh, Ed Byers from Yaza. Sorry. Okay, uh, it's on, yeah. Uh, other comments or question from any youth here, uh, represented here, nothing? Yeah, uh, thank you very much because actually uh, when you speak about engineering from the all the different pillars of work, uh, capacity building and finance and then uh, integrate solutions specifically in the African continent, I would just say that innovation really adds uh, cross-cutting when you speak of the African continent and a huge potential of case studies and really projects that were implemented and that we did maybe one of the things that we need to work on it is really the dissemination of this kind and the business model because certainly uh, in your research, the work that you've done, the private sector implementing the African economy, the French institutions, you witness this kind of uh, solutions and you witness how we have the community, we have the aim and bliss, but we just need to have a, a push uh, in order to give more attention to this continent in terms of access to finance and also understanding of the needs to invest in the large scale infrastructure as well. Uh, so maybe uh, in order to have no, that, yes. I, I have to yeah, say yeah. that yeah. I, uh, on the on the dissemination of the information, I'll send Peter my paper from the, the set on the biogas in small scale so that next time you will have also an example of the small scale biogas in, in <laughs> I Africa will do. I, will, I don't the have the right to say that, but uh, I will also <laughs> disseminate what we did in uh, the region, the integrated business model that we did in the Arab region, and obviously look at really a similar example, but really uh, in, in, in the conflict areas and how we really can have, from engineer perspective, uh, really uh, smart solutions. And yeah, Peter, have something to share with yeah, us as uh, well. Maybe I'll just <laughs> touch on your point about the high cost of capital for developing countries. It's it's definitely a, an issue and a challenge. I think there's, so when we, when we invest, we look at first the, uh, the sovereign risk, the risk you know, associated with the country, and then we layer on top the risk associated with that particular company, that particular borrower if we're doing a debt investment. And so you have both elements and you know, certain countries are more risky, certain countries are less. 
Um, and, then, and then, of course, when we're talking about this sector, you have companies that have thin balance sheets that are not particularly profitable, if at all, that have l relatively short track records. And so the combination of you know, political instability in many of the markets that we're, that we're investing in, um, other uh, you know, uh, sort of macroeconomic challenges associated with the, the countries, layer on top all of the, the micro sort of company specific challenges, that all adds up to a significant sort of uh, risk profile and therefore cost of capital. When we obviously think about what is our loss rate, right? How, wh how is our portfolio going to perform given all of these risk factors? And then the, the returns that we need to deliver to our investors, right? So that's, that's just, I'm giving my, our example, uh, which cuts across all the investors, right? Everybody kind of has to take into account the cost of their capital and then the risk profile of their deployment and all of that. But I think that there is a, 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 a lot of um, truth to the fact that it really is a mix of real and perceived risk, right? Africa is risky, but it's thought of as being more risky than, than it actually is, right? And uh, especially if you're structuring your investments well, um, if, you're, yeah, if you're doing things right, uh, uh, Africa and, and these markets are not as risky as uh, a lot of for foreign capital sees them as being. Th what's really needed, especially at the early stage, is local capital. There's a dearth of local risk capital. Um, and of course, when it's a, a business model or a sector that's not very attractive financially, what if you think about impact investors, where are most impact investors? They're coming from London, Amsterdam, San Francisco. They're not in Nairobi and Joburg, and those guys are more commercial investors, right? And so, but those are the investors that actually need to be investing at the early stage in these innovative business models. They know the markets, they're closer to the entrepreneurs, um, and uh, that's how it works, right? Local investors invest in at the early stage. So I think that's, that's another element to the sort of high cost of capital because you're relying on foreign capital in a lot of cases. Yeah, the, that's why we need uh, more to build the capacity to local institutions and really to invest and have the role of rather the, the, the public institutions of the government in order to make this possible and reduce the cost. And that's why we make it on the sustainability part and the AAG performance for all the banks and specifically the local banks. Uh, but this is all debate, uh, we can continue on it, but let's uh, remain on the Council of Engineering and the role that can bring to the sustainable development agenda in the African continent. Uh, over to you, Anna. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. Thanks for it, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thanks everyone for being here. I just wanna thank everyone in the audience here and everyone that's joining us virtually for sharing this space with us. Um, and of course, thank you to all the incredible panelists. It surely has been one of uh, like a very engaging and insightful um, discussion that I'm sure will lead some spark of thoughts in the next couple of days for everyone here. So as we have seen today and as we have known and we will continue to see Africa and as in the rest of the world, we are seeing the devastating consequences of the climate change and the whole situation that we're in. Um, we also know that Africa is one of the regions that produce the less uh, percentage of total global emission, carbon emissions. And on top of that, it is a region that has a lot of potential in terms of renewable resources, especially solar and wind. Um, so if we see all of this, it puts Africa in a very strategic and yet challenging situation to be at. Um, and the discussions that we had today I hope, like my hope with this is that they give us a reminder of that every challenge is also an opportunity. And I hope that we get out of this today and then tomorrow after the whole day um, with that in mind. And I hope we take this as an opportunity to change this and to not only in Africa, but in the rest of the world, see this uh, as a new <coughs> opportunity for transformation and change. Um, so I think just to wrap it up, um, what we saw today, what we discussed today. For Africa specifically, we do need three things that I would prioritize and I would just like you guys to leave that um, in, on top of your minds. So first of all, of course, it's very relevant to the panel, technology. We do need technology. We need very much, we need to keep investing in, te in technology. Technology not only reduces costs, but also accelerates the transition. And we know we are against the clock in every single 
matter related to climate change. Um, second of all, we need financing, as we just talked about. Uh, we need a lot of financing. We need to especially keep fostering and implementing innovative financial instruments in the different markets. Um, they need to address both local and international capital, and they need to implement the different technologies that we have in terms of financing for that. And then third of all, we need capacity building. So we need to actually empower local communities. It's not only necessary to leave them with the knowledge and with the tools without capacity building. Some of the failed um, situations, not only in Africa, but in the rest of the world, reflect that uh, most of the cases, you have the solution and you give them the solution, either with technology or with a financial instrument, a new fund, um, and then it's not sustainable because you don't have the capacity to actually keep it going. So I would leave with that. Um, thank you again for being here, and I hope you enjoyed the, the discussion. Thank you very much, and uh, join me to thank all the panelists and for Santiago.